Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And before I start the show, I just want to tell you that Suzanne Wilson and I, you may remember her, she's a great psychic medium, and we're friends. We actually recorded a webinar that uh, we had a live audience, and we talked about the afterlife and the holidays. And if you are listening to this episode when it is just coming out, it's just prior to Christmas. The holidays can be a really tough time, as you know, if you've lost a loved one. And they're not lost, actually. Um, it's a term I just used, but they are with you, just on the other side. So we recorded this webinar. It's a two-hour replay that's available to you that we talk about. Uh, I give my top 10 reasons that I believe in the afterlife with a pretty cool slideshow. And um, Suzanne talks, she actually does some medium readings right there on the webinar. And there's some great advice about how to connect with your loved ones and some help with grief. Now we are selling this as a product for $35, 100% money back guarantee with a lot of free gifts. And we're doing that to help raise some funds to keep We Don't Die Radio going. As you know, I I do this on purpose, commercial free. I hate commercials. Uh, So this is all funded by myself and some with generous donations. So this is being sold as a product that can, you can feel good about giving. And you can find this webinar at We Don't Die Radio and then click on store. So enough about that. Let's move on to our cool guest. Her name is Cynthia Sue Larson, and she calls herself the Quantum Optimist. She is the best-selling author of Quantum Jumps, Reality Shifts, and High Energy Money. She's a neat lady. She has a degree in physics, an MBA degree. She's a doctor of divinity and a black belt in martial arts. She's a spiritual life coach and hosts her own show called Living the Quantum Dream. Her website is realityshifters.com. And there's a lot more about Cynthia, but we're going to let her tell us all in her own words. Cynthia Sue Larson, a warm, warm welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Oh, thank you, Sandra. I'm so glad to be here today. It's such a pleasure. It is. It's great. <laughs> and you're coming from Berkeley, California. And I'm I am. On the opposite coast of the United States and near Boston, Massachusetts. So it doesn't matter where we are. And, and uh, welcome to our listener, too, wherever you are in the world. We really want to thank you for joining us on this conversation. So, Cynthia, where's your story begin? I know just by the few moments we talked, I uh, already have a smile on my face. So you are an optimist. <laughs> but tell us a little yes. bit about yourself. Okay. Well, I did have a lifelong interest in the nature of reality. And so I'm I'm someone that's part of a new phenomenon. People don't know the term yet, but it's called born aware. And it just means that you kind of remember the good vibes before you were born from, and then, you know, fill in the blank. Uh, so there, there's a book about it. Diane Brandon just wrote about it called Born Aware. So I'm mentioning that just so you know. Um, but when I was very young, I really thought I was on the wrong planet because I remembered a place where everybody can greet everyone with full love from your heart and you just everyone speaks the truth and it's not this crazy earth that just made me feel right off the bat like I was on the, in the wrong place so i'm putting that out there first so that's great I, think- <laughs> I have not heard about, about born aware i think that's pretty yeah. pretty great yeah it's so cool so i'm saying that first so you know that i'm not normal in a good way mm-hmm. <laughs> So I think it's a good way. So yes. what it means is when, when I look at people, I tend to see their hearts first. I, you can ask me for a description of them, but I, I know them by their spirit, by what motivates them on the inside. And I can really feel that. So putting that out there first. Yeah. I like it. But, but yes, I do have stories uh, to share. Real life experiences with two of my most beloved friends and family members who I have personal proof that love never dies, that that death is not the end. Um, Even though I knew that coming in, I've been reaffirmed for me in a huge way. I'd love to share this. Oh, I'd love to hear. We'd love to hear. Yeah. So I'll start by um, describing uh, the first situation happened where I was, I don't expect to hear from people when they passed on, even though, you know, I came into this life with that understanding. It's not something you expect to hear. 
And, uh, you know, I've t- I try to live a normal life ever since I got here. <laughs> I've been doing my best, even though my research is a little cutting edge and a bit bizarre. It has to do with quantum jumps and reality shifts. But dis- despite all that, I had a friend that I worked with at Citibank for many years. And he was a manager like I was. I worked in the data center at the time. Back This goes back to the 1980s. And his name was John. And I used to go on vacations with his wife and him and my husband and myself. We'd go to Canada, enjoy the wilderness, took a train ride across Canada. And at some point on one of those vacations, my friend um, asked me the darndest thing. He said, John said, and he's a friend I would walk with him at lunch and talk about about um, ETs and angels. And we had great conversations. But But he asked something on one of these vacations to Canada that kind of chilled me to the bone because he said, he said, I want you to promise me that when I die, you won't grieve and you won't mourn and you'll instead celebrate the joy and life of my life instead. Mm-hmm. And he made me, he made me promise this. And I said, John, I you're my best friend. And I'm, I'm looking beseechingly at his wife, Bonnie, and I'm looking at her in the eyes like, how can I promise him that? And she's just laughing like, I don't know. And I said, John, how can I do that? Um, I'll just be so sad if you die. I, I, I'll try to be happy, but I, I don't know how I can do that. I don't know how I can keep that promise. Sure. So now fast forward a whole bunch of years, and he and Bonnie have a child, and my husband and I have two daughters. And then um, I was kind of, I haven't really forgotten this bizarre incident because it stood out, but I wasn't thinking about it all the time. So one day, um, both of my children are in school. One's a preschooler, the other one's in, like, I don't know, kindergarten or first grade or something. But anyway, uh, I'm with my little one, and we're waiting before we pick up my older daughter. And then we pick up, I've got both daughters, and they, um, they, they're, asked, they're begging me to go to an art store and buy something. And I don't know what comes over me, but I just feel like, okay, why not? Let's have an unbirthday party. And so we get gifts for the birthday party. We come home. I make an unbirthday cake. Um, my husband comes home. We sing the unbirthday song. We have the unbirthday gifts. And then I get go to take a bath to kind of wind down and calm down. And my husband just sort of barges into the bathroom. And he says, you know, you've got to take this call. And so I said, hello. And then it was Bonnie. And she said, John's dead. I'm at the hospital right now. He just died of a heart attack. Wow. And so what I'm telling you, I mean, this, there's a lot more to this story. This is just the beginning of it. <laughs> but um, but with this experience, I realized I kept my promise. And it, it was it was a while before I really realized it, that I'd kept it, but I totally did keep it. And so that's one way of knowing that we are connected on a very deep level. Um, not only did I keep that promise, but... Um, John was with, he, he loved to fish. And so sometime after he died, uh, uh, we went, we took all of our kids, Bonnie and, and her son and my daughters, and we all went fishing to a local fishing hole and uh, just were remembering him there. And on the way there, uh, it, it's just little things really, but I could feel his presence because my daughters, one of them wanted a sold out Pokemon gold power ball, ball Burger King toy. And they got it. They got it, even though that they were all out. And I knew that was John because that was that same day of the fishing trip. And then there have been lots of other experiences uh, with with John. You know, just it just it, this was just really remarkable to me because I felt like, okay, this is huge. There's a connection that goes far beyond death itself. And and I can I can hear him. And okay, another big story that happened with John. One more about John. Uh, there are lots, but I'm just picking out the best of. Okay, on another occasion, I was working out my own issues with John because I was angry that he died. <laughs> and I think a lot of listeners can relate. Even yes. you love people, but you can get pissed off. And it's I, part I was, of the grieving process, sorry to say, can be. I know, yeah, totally. So I, w- I went to an author's talk, and it was about heart health. It was from Heart Math Institute. And so I just seated myself and... I was looking at the brochure about what the speaker would be talking about, about how to keep your heart healthy. Now, John had died of a heart attack, and he loved things like pizza and foods that probably shouldn't have been eating. And so for some reason, I just got all upset. I'm just sitting there by myself, 
starting to feel angry. You know how this can happen. You know, something tr triggers it. And in this room, there were some huge double doors to my right. And there was no wind outside at all. But suddenly, the doors just blew open. And this is John's style. He had this very dramatic flair. Like he would wear these beautiful suits with a tie that, with a silk kerchief that matched when we worked at Citibank. Uh, he always was dressed very elegantly. And I could just feel his presence like, I'm here. <laughs> and it made me laugh. I was still angry, but I could, there was no wind. You have to understand, these doors just blew open. Like I'm angry. I'm sitting there in my chair kind of fuming. You can just sort of see the cartoon smoke coming out my ears. And I'm, I'm feeling like, darn it, John, why didn't you pay attention to your diet? You knew better. Mm -hmm. Right. You're eating these garbage foods. You knew it. You knew this would do this. And then <laughs> these French doors blow open, and I can he sort of see him in my mind's eye, like, ta-da, I'm here. And it, it made me laugh in spite of myself. And it kind of broke through, the, the, I think the last, it was the, the end of my anger, which had been going on for some months at that point. So, But but I could I really knew that was him. Everyone else jumped out of their seats like they felt a ghost or something. Like, what the heck? <laughs> yeah, because that doesn't normally happen. There no. are some <laughs> weird things that are so obvious. Like, it's got to <laughs> yeah. be somebody coming through. And if you that was totally... felt him and saw him in your mind. Yeah. So, and and then his, um, his later his wife, Bonnie, passed away. And the, the day she died, um, their son got an e email from her saying, just hi. And that freaked him out. But um, this, this totally happens too. People get emails, uh, sometimes phone messages. So this is a very real phenomenon. And in fact, when I played back a message, a phone message that John had left on the answering machine, at that time I had a record, phone recorder that I could play backwards. And I don't know why I was doing that, except I just wanted to analyze every single scrap of that last phone message he'd left for me. And when I played it backwards, it said, satin room now. And um, that just kind of gave me a chill. It's like, and even when he was leaving that phone message, he was getting together with friends. It's like on some level, I think he knew, even though his death was a surprise, it was a heart attack when he was at work. He wasn't really expecting it. Nobody had told him that he would be dying of heart disease. Mm -hmm. So, but on some deep level, I'm pretty sure that he knew that I know that, that everybody was connected. So there's, there's always some deeper meaning here. And that he had that conversation with you, too, about when he does die, you know, to celebrate his life and all that. Exactly. Hmm. Well, I, I love the signs that you uh, talk about. Even the phone, I've talked to people that um, their loved one is in the spirit world and suddenly their phone shows that, you know, it was just ringing from their phone number and then they dial it back and this is a number no longer in service. You know, that sort of thing happens. And uh, I love it. Right. It's ways of trying to get through. So where does your story story go? If you would just share more about you and, and what you're up to and um, right. Well, yeah. I shared, <laughs> I'm an author, so congratulations. Also, yes. <laughs> thank you. So I write books about consciousness and I include stories. Um, little excerpts from this one went into my book called reality shifts when consciousness changes the physical world. And I talked about um, my young daughter um, was, was just wondering about people living their lives. And so she also had had dreams. You know, sometimes children are very tuned in also to these experiences. Mm -hmm. And so I, and my book Reality Shifts is actually about a sort of a different phenomenon, but it touches on what we're talking in the sense that sometimes it's possible to see dead pets or people alive again. This is part of the reality shift phenomenon that's popularized in the last seven years. Uh, there's another name for it now called Mandela Effect. Hmm. But I was, I, I've been writing about this since 1990s. And so, you know, I've been doing this research for 20 years. But now it's affecting a huge group of people that, for example, they noticed Nelson Mandela was alive again. And in my book, Reality Shifts, I, I write about um, a cat, my roommate's cat being alive again after it had passed away. And also... Larry Hagman, the actor, at the yeah. time I wrote the book in the 90s, he had died and then he was alive again. And so... What do you mean I, by alive again? Okay, now and we're getting... Man. Okay, it's I know this is going to be deep, 
Yeah. <laughs> but I just need a little taste of what you mean because I don't get it. Okay. Okay. I know. I know. It's. Um, but I'm intrigued. Is, intrigued. Yep. And the young people today, uh, pretty much all of the millennium millennials know about this Mandela effect. And they know it um, based on Nelson Mandela being alive again, literally alive again. So I'll just start with that one because that's the – more people have heard about this recently. Okay. And okay. I'll back up and start at the beginning. So – uh, there's a blogger named Fiona Broom, and she uh, went to a convention, a conference, and at the conference, they, I think it was about comics or, I, I don't know, fantasy, something like that. But she was talking to people, and they were discussing how they were, several of them were surprised to see that the South American political leader, Nelson Mandela, apparently was alive. And, uh, and people, including Fiona Broom, recalled that he had died while incarcerated in South Africa. And so she kind of came back from the conference with a, a bee in her bonnet, like, let's check this out. Let's go research it. And because she's an investig investigator of paranormal phenomena, mm -hmm. she took it to heart to, uh, to find out where does this go? Uh, how common is it that people uh, remember things differently than the actual facts seem to present? Uh, and this is a so when it's someone famous and it's not a personal family member, they're often the periphery of our uh, observational view. So we don't necessarily see Nelson Mandela every day. We're not necessarily tracking Nelson Mandela. We don't make a big point to notice now he's dead. And then, wait a minute, now I see news that he's alive. Then I must, most of us, when we notice something like that, we tend to figure, I must have misremembered this. And so Fiona Broom was one of the first mainstream bloggers and paranormal researchers to basically say, this is definitely happening. Now, to, to, to give credit where credit is due, I'd like to, first of all, uh, the first researcher who ever indicated this was happening is actually PMH Atwater, who's a near-death experience researcher, and yes. she's written books. So she mentioned this phenomenon in her book, Future Memory, and she's the first one to have ever published anything on the topic. And... And then I published my books not knowing about PMH Atwater, and now, more recently, Fiona Broom has come along. So when I say that people who are dead are alive again, it mostly impacts people that are not our loved ones. They're not the ones that give us the deepest grief and the heartache and the sense of tremendous loss um, in general. There are exceptions to this, such as in South America, where... Apparently, some people expect that dead might be alive again. And so if there's an expectation, it can happen more often in that culture. But now he actually passed away at 95, right? Wow. So I, I, I wish I could tell you, I know because it's a, a big concept to get, but I don't quite get it. Okay. Okay. And this is where I was a little hesitant to go. All yeah, the way but down. let's go there. Why not? Because there could be a okay. millennial listening going, Sandra, don't you get it? Duh. Mm -hmm. I know what this is, but it's interesting because there's so much more to being human than meets the eye. Like, I think a lot of us, it's so easy to buy into our flesh and bones and think, uh, you know, question whether the afterlife's real and all that. But you know, we, I do believe what, that we're souls having this human experience and that there's so much that we're capable of and there's so much our minds are capable of. You know, we just have no idea really what's possible, you know, so I love hearing new, new things. So I'm, I'm open. I really am because I, you know, this is something you've given your life to and your research for so many years, this field. And, and I'm open to have my, my mind, um, opened up a little. But I just Good. don't know what you mean by, um, they'll just talk a little bit more about it. Cause like he, okay. di he died in time and space. Yeah. And I think he was right. 95 in South Africa. Exactly. Uh, okay. And so, um, this is the reason I write books about it because it's, uh, it does actually kind of take a book to sort of let it all sink yes, in, percolate. Yep. And <laughs> That's okay. Because what, what I'm talking about is that, uh, just because something happened doesn't mean it's, factually true anymore so often cases our memories are you can imagine it like we've experienced what you might think of as a parallel reality okay. and and my research is indicating that this is the way nature operates so it's not so much that it only happens once and then you're in the so quote unquote wrong world or something like okay. that 
Um, but but I've been watching, uh, and the reason I do the radio podcast originally was to get scientists on my Living the Quantum Dream radio show to talk about their narrow fields of interest mm-hmm. that nonetheless provide very clear clues that we are definitely living in primarily a quantum universe, which means the consciousness has a very important role in what we, in the sense that what we observe is what happens. And and then what, what I'm actually tracking through the 20 years of my research is that we're witnessing uh, kind of quantum jumps, if you will, where a quantum particle can jump from one state to another. It can do that instantly. It can. It's kind of like now you see me, now you don't. Mm-hmm. And, uh, qu- quantum particles are like magical things, and they're very co- uh, they're very correlated with consciousness itself. So the observers do matter, and the observer plays a role. There's no such thing as scientific research in quantum physics where you don't have an observer. You have to have an observer. And as soon as you do that, like like just this month in December 2017, uh, physics publications have published proof that you can run times backwards, that um, this absolutely works because of correlations that can be set up in, um, across time. It's, it's something like quantum entanglement, but it's a little bit different. It's a correlation, and it's what I've been talking about in my books, Reality Shifts and Quantum Jumps. Um, for some time now. So, so so to back up and answer your question, what's going on? Um, you can imagine it like there are many possible realities. And near-death experiencers often witness this. Mm-hmm. So if you were, like that book, uh, Dying to Be Me by Anita Morjani. Yeah, great I book. Highly, oh, yeah, so you remember the part where she's pretty much dead. She's in a wheelchair. Her brother's flying out to, to be with her. and And in her state where she's kind of been... I think the doctors are watching her and to their equipment, she's pretty much dying. So she's having a near-death experience. And in that, that amazing sort of beyond time and space moment, she's aware of all the possibilities. And that is something you can also access through lucid dreaming and meditation. And if you're just walking down the hallway thinking of kind of nothing in particular and you go into a theta state, then you can't remember what you were doing. It's kind of like you go through a doorway and it feels like a portal. Yes. We all ex- we all experience this all the time. It's normal. So my research is just showing that the choices we make literally take us into different universes. And with the way that our mind works, it's very uh, – our cognition and our decision-making processes are definitely quantum. And I had Jerome Busemeyer on my radio show and also um, – John Joe McFadden. Um, John Joe wrote a book called Life on the Edge. He talks about quantum biology, mm-hmm. and he and he's been doing this for years. And then Jerome Busemeyer talks about our minds are actually quantum. So he, he's proved he's um, basically showing that with uh, algorithms, uh, formulas. And so his book is a little technical, but it's got great stories and it's well worth reading. Also, and and you can just if people want to hear this, they can go listen to Living the Quantum Dream, track those shows down, and it's great information. So I've been tracking these threads to, to figure out why is it that people like myself and Fiona Broom and so many people remember, and you do too, you remember that, um, you know, Nelson Mandela passed away like in the 90s. He was, you know, he didn't get out of jail. Uh, he was I wasn't sure if he passed away in the 80s or 90s because I wasn't paying attention to it at the time. But I do remember it sure isn't the way it is now where he died just a few years ago. And so some of us have seen him him die twice. And then in the case of someone like Jane Goodall, I remember she died right after Diane Fossey died. But now she's, thank goodness, alive and well. And I saw her in person a couple years ago. when She came on a book tour through Berkeley. So, uh, but she's another one that I'm grateful is alive again. This is Um, wild, this concept, by the way. I know you've been sharing it, but I'm going, am I hearing what I'm hearing? Hmm. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. Wikipedia says he died in 2013, Um, Mandela. Anyways. Exactly. And so... and so what I'm suggesting is if you track down Mandela effect and take a look at what people are noticing, uh, you'll see things changing in movie dialogue, product names, uh, all sorts of things. Oh, yeah. And Mandela you- effect comes right up. Alternate realities. 
Well, I'm intrigued by it all. I've seen some really cool videos on YouTube of some quantum stuff that is you know, real, like the observer, observer effect. I can't describe it, but I remember, I mean, you probably could, but I remember seeing some of these things and just being baffled by what's possible. And I think for most human beings, and I grew up in a way that, you know, we had to see it to believe it kind of a thing, not having any clue that we are all made up of these tiny little particles that at their very core are invisible, you know, (laughs) if that's a good way of putting it. I mean, when we really look down to the quantum level of everything, all it is is energy. All we are, right? right? With this illusion that there's time and space and we can touch things and everything. So these kind of concepts, while it's new to me, um, you know, I've experienced some stuff too that it's like, there's there's something else going on here. There's is a there's a much bigger picture. That's right. And the it what it drives home is the point that we are consciousness having these dreamlike human physical experiences. And and that's kind of a trip too. I, I know this may be farther out there than <laughs> than we're supposed to go on your show. But. No, it's okay. I mean even when we look at, you know, our eyes are our eyes really seeing? No, that's reflections. And there's, we could go really far down this rabbit hole um, in investigations. And do you remember the movie? I'm sure you do. What the bleep do we know? Yes. Yeah. With Fred Ellen Wolf yeah. being Dr. Quantum. Yeah. And it's the Dr. Quantum YouTube videos that I saw that blew my mind and that movie. Uh, but that was the first thing that made me start thinking. Because when I was exploring all this possibility of the afterlife, and I'm thinking energy can never be destroyed, so doesn't it make perfect sense that, you know, there's this invisible world around us that why not um, have our loved ones be living there? You know, so that's when I first started putting it all together, when I started getting open to some of these concepts. And some of the biggest ways to break through into this um, state of awareness as they show in What the Bleep Do We Know, is this idea of a multiverse with all those bouncing basketballs, if you remember that scene. Mm -hmm, I do. And that's a great movie because it shows that a person can, through their own perspective and their own attitude and their own view of the world, uh, you as the observer have a big role to play. And so the way we love ourselves, as the protagonist in the movie was showing, you know, she was... A wonderful actress, you know, just showing that she could start loving herself and find her way into viewing everything very positively. And that's, that's absolutely true. So. Oh, it is. And even uh, what we, yeah, what we focus on kind of grows and even it takes something. I know personally to go from a grumpy mood and put on the hat, a hat of being grateful and optimistic. But once I do, don't I notice that my surrounding world changes also? Am yeah. I on the same? Are we? Are we speaking the same language? <laughs> yeah, you totally speak in the same language, <laughs> and that's. I believe this is that connection that cuts through time and space, and this is that feeling of love that we have for each other, and that's why many of us have these experiences where we know for sure that we're connecting with consciousness, even after someone is supposedly gone, but they're not gone because. The love never dies and the consciousness never dies. Mm. I can't help but think, you know, you hear about things called apports or things that can weren't there before and then they're suddenly there in our line of view. And there must be something happening in yes. th- in these alternative realities that uh, even a friend of mine and her <laughs> husband have been sitting regularly together and lo and behold this unbelievably big looks like an eagle's feather appeared in their home right in front of them that was not there (laughs) just prior you know and it's we believe it's the spirit world sending one of these apports through but like how in the world could that happen like there's got to be some things happening uh, with de- dematerializations and these alternative realities. I mean, who who knows how to explain it, but just things are possible. And I've had many experiences like that, too. Have um, you? 
Well, remember, I've been tracking this consciousness phenomenon for 20 years, and I, it's called reality shifts because reality it's, shifts. It's, it's literally about things appearing, which is apports, um, also disappearing, yes, trans, transforming, transporting, and changes in the way we experience time. And so apports are very much a part of this in terms of things that I've witnessed just showing up literally out of thin air. Um, like, like noteworthy examples include my daughter, when she was um, one of my two daughters, my younger daughter had lost her tooth. It fell out at school in her first grade classroom. The teacher crumpled it up in a paper towel and told her to keep it like that. But then at the end of the day, my daughter couldn't find it in her backpack and there were little crumpled paper towels all over the floor. And she, my daughter just ended up in tears and she came home just crying like, I don't have anything for the tooth fairy. Uh -huh. So I said, that's okay. The tooth fairy knows. And I tucked her in and I, I was at that point uh, keeping a little record of the baby teeth she was losing and had a card I was writing them on. So the girl, my daughters had both gone to bed. I'm in my bedroom and I'm writing on this card, an index card, and three inches above my hand. There's nobody else in the room with me. It's just me. <clears throat> and three inches above my hand, a little baby tooth falls onto the card I'm writing as I'm writing the words that my daughter had lost her tooth that day at school. Bizarre. And it, and it was clean. It, um, I have to, you know, parents of young children know these teeth hardly ever come home clean. They're, there's usually fresh or dried blood on them. And, you know, it's the kind of thing you don't bother cleaning out because I don't know what it would take to clear it. But this was crystal clean. It was a very, it's like it had been laser cleaned or something. A little baby tooth cl just clean and fell like that. And that's one of many, many things that have apported. As well as light switches going on, windows opening. Um, you name it, pretty much has happened in my life. And th these are reality shifts I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And so as far as what's going on, good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's it's okay to not understand, right? Because, like, I haven't a clue how my cell phone <laughs> can pick up images from wherever in the world the cloud is and have all information known to mankind, you know, in the palm of my hand. So I don't have to know how it works to believe in it. And I think the same is true for reality shifts and these things on the quantum level. Yes, that's a good analogy, actually, because consciousness is a lot like the cloud in the sense that there's, uh, you know, when people pass away, it's we feel like they're gone. But if you ever look at a dead body, you know they're not. That wasn't them. You can see that when my grandmother died, I was the first one of my family on the scene. And I'll tell that story, too, because um, yes. this, is very, this is fascinating. Okay, so in this case, I had been, uh, it's, it's extraordinary, actually. Uh, my, I should start by backing up and explaining. This is my mother's mother I'm talking about. And she was the nearest and dearest family member to me because she, she understood more than anybody else uh, my love for angels and heaven. And uh, She wasn't born aware like I was, but uh, she had lost her husband when uh, he was still quite young of a brain tumor. And then she'd become quite spiritual. So she ended up being one of the most religious, most spiritual people I've ever met a real believer in the Bible, in Christ. She was a Lutheran. Mm -hmm. And um, I, even the ministers didn't have as much faith as she had. She, she was just amazing and so much love. So that's, in a nutshell, a little bit about her. And she's a, a Swedish, uh, she's the child of Swedish immigrants who'd come to America and grown up. Um, she was born in 1906, so she had seen uh, Native indigenous people um, in the Washington state where she was growing up, all that. So uh, anyway, uh, the sequence of events that got interesting happened in 2005. It started when I got a phone call from a bookstore in Sacramento uh, asking me something that's a typical question, except it was not typical. Um, they were asking me to confirm a book event, which sounds normal, except, right. I, except I never booked that event. Um, but I'm an author, and I know you don't say no to a book event. You right. basically. <laughs> I know that. So I pulled out my calendar, and I said, let's make this work. Um, I can be there. And I th they probably thought I was a nutcase. Like, well, you're the one that 
set it up to begin with. Remember, um, I'm familiar with these alternate realities. So when something like this happens, I already know that things are in play. What you might call synchronicity, what I would call, uh, you know, quantum effects on a macroscopic scale. In other words, a reality shift, a quantum jump. So I know something's going on, but I don't know what. So I go and do the book event. The whole day, I'm, um, it's very close to the care center where my grandmother was living at the time. And I kept getting psychic um, questions from her, like, will you come and visit me? And I would just psychically send back, yes, of course, I'm right here. I'll be right over as soon as this thing wraps up. And so I was at the end of the event, it was about five o'clock. I'm packing up my books and saying goodbye to people. And they're serving chocolate cake. And I said, what's the occasion? And they said, no occasion. And, you know, that should have been a red flag for me. Like, like, what is this, an unbirthday party? And they said, you could call it that. I'm like, oh, no. But I, it didn't occur to me. Anyway, then I get in the car and I'm driving to her care facility and I'm starting to experience memories that I didn't know I had seen from her vantage point of when I was born and it snowed that day in Sacramento in January and then uh, lots of things I don't remember at all because I was a baby, a toddler and then, then things I did remember but from her point of view and then kind of like from a God's eye point of view just seeing me with my grandma visiting her all through the years, and then just a knowingness that, uh, like my grandmother's telling me, your sister was here yesterday. And at this point, now, now I finally parked my car. I'm walking into the building. I open the doors. Her, the door to her room is shut. It's never shut. So I ask an attendant, is it okay to go in? And they said, wow, you got here fast. And I said, what do you mean? You, you called me? And, and it turned out they tried to call my sister, but they didn't have the right phone number. And I said, what happened? And they said, your grandmother just passed away. And she was still warm to the touch. Uh, so when I walked in, I, you know, I, I was right there with her. But the thing is, uh, she's so religious, so spiritual, and I could see uh, it just glowing, shining right behind her body. Her body looked like a shell. It, that was not her. But who she was, I could see her standing next to her, just behind her, her, her behind her bed. It was I could see her on the on my right and on her left was Jesus Christ, um, taller than she was. But they're standing beaming. They look so happy at this point. I'm really starting to cry. I, I, it's involuntary. Of course. <laughs> yeah. She's my favorite family member. Yeah. I know she's happy. I can see it. I can see her. I can see Jesus. And I'm still crying like a baby, you know, like, oh, my gosh. So but um, it's a very important story because. There's no way I would have been there that day. Um, my parents were out of the country, so I was the only family member that could make it. And I happened to be in town, two miles away, on my way there, within minutes of when she died. And, and you again, had just gotten that slideshow of memories yep. from her perspective uh, downloaded yeah. into your brain. That's right. And so the the, the full life review is real. Uh, you know, I went through it with her and. And if you've seen that movie, Defending Your Life with Meryl Streep. My favorite movie of all time. That. I've oh, seen gosh. it probably 24 times. And if yes. anyone hasn't seen it, it is a comedy that deals oh, with yes. the afterlife. Defending Your Life. Albert oh, Brooks gosh. and Meryl Streep. I love it, love it, love I, it, love it. You know, I, I haven't so told you, times. love it. I love it. Too. Love it. <laughs> my favorite, my favorite. So, yeah, Neva, my grandmother, was just like that. She was like Meryl Streep. So, you know, no problems going straight to heaven for that one. <laughs> you know, right. She lived like an angel. So, oh my gosh. But uh, yeah, so her full life review, it was just joyful, just seeing all the good times, uh, just how much love she had for everybody. Uh, it was really a, a reminder for me of how to live one's life in a spiritual way, to be that caring, to be that change in the world. You know, rather, it's easy to feel sad, but we can overcome some of the grief by being in service. And you know, just asking, what can we do? And she always did that. She was just so sweet. And, you know, she had such a great attitude of just always saying, I am so blessed. Oh, so. I'm sure she's <laughs> met my grandmother by now. Because that, oh, yeah. that sounds like my Grammy. And um, there, yeah. I was told my Grammy's a greeter in heaven, just filled with love and and positivity. And, oh, it, you know, you talked about that um Someone joining in on that, uh, the death experience. Ray, Dr. Raymond Moody actually wrote a book about the shared death experience. And I think it's just fascinating that there are, you know, that part of your story is not unique, that there are other people that 
witness it. And so however they're tuned in together, whether it's their love for each other that allows that or not, I don't know, but it's a very real thing. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and I could feel that she was, uh, that Neva had called me to be there that day. And it turned out that was absolutely correct. What she told me in the, in the near death experience, when she, I could feel her spirit so close telling me Wendy, my sister had been there the day before that was true. And, you know, all these things turned out to be true. Uh, somehow the care facility did not have the right, right phone number, but that was meant to be because I was there right there. At the, I was there and I'm the one in my, of all the people in my family, I'm the one that can see Jesus. So thank goodness it was me. So, you know, it all makes sense in retrospect. <laughs> mm. Does Jesus look like the pictures we see of him? Mm. Woman who's seen he, Jesus? Well, my eyes were streaked with tears, so it's kind of like third eye vision at that so point. So you knew it was he, Jesus. <laughs> but his light, his love. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. To me, it's it's um, unmistakable. I know some people say you can be fooled. I don't think so, because you're looking at the very essence of what is all that is good and all that is right and true. And it's, it's just pure love. It's God. It's But it's Jesus. So. My dad loved Jesus, went to church every day, and all he wanted to do was be like a living example of like who Jesus was. Like so my dad was all about Jesus. And uh you know, I haven't not lived my life all about Jesus. I love Jesus, but I don't ever, you know, he's not a part of my daily life. Hasn't been. Um but after my dad passed, I had two people, two separate occasions, didn't know each other and they it was just so random that they said, uh, excuse me, just need to ask you, is your dad deceased? Yeah. Is his name John? Yeah. <laughs> Was he about this tall and this what he looked like? Yeah. And they both said to me the exact same thing. Your dad wants you to know that he is with Jesus. Just like that. And wow. I thought, oh my gosh. And that was so strong. My dad wanted me to get that message. That gives me goosebumps. Yeah, <laughs> me too. And they were both people that, although they were intuitive, they're not out in the world being mediums or anything, but they felt so strongly and neither one of them knew me that they had to, they had to share this. Yes. Great. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's totally great. And the, I, I think that goes with the whole point of the show you're doing. So in, in my mind, you are working for Jesus. Because you're showing us, showing all of us that, that love never dies, you know, that this is something that keeps going, that it's, um, you know, we are connected through love and we are much bigger than we think. And no matter how difficult and challenging life may seem to be, love is really what's truly real. These other measurables that we, that people think mistakenly they can measure themselves by, whether it's their money or their toys or possessions. And Jesus showed us that doesn't make any sense. Uh, but truly, you know, what really matters most is having uh, this sense of divinity in your heart, whatever you may call it, you know, just knowing that this highest level of goodness as it is. Uh, I say this because my father, when I was growing up, he he was an atheist. He's come around and now he's more of an agnostic. But um, it was not a very spiritual household I grew up in. And I think that was good in the sense that I am very open-minded to people of all spiritual and religious paths. And so as long as there's a, an influence and a recognition of the highest level of spiritual goodness, that's fine. You know, I think there are many ways to see the one God. I think that it's, you know, humans have different languages. We have different, yeah. like you said, you know, different senses. I see red, you see red, but is it the same red? We don't really know. Um, but yet, um, the idea of God is so much beyond our mindset, we can't comprehend it fully. We certainly can't measure it. But it's it's the most important concept that we have. Mm. Cynthia, this time of year that we're recording this is around the Christmas season, the holiday season, which can be very tough for people. I may not, in this brief hour that we have, get my head around the 20 plus years of research and writing that you have done. And I get that and I'm okay with that, but you've left me wanting to find out more about it. But as far as being proactive in our life, is there any way we can create a shift in our own lives to bring about good or goodness? Do you know what I'm asking? Because I think a lot yeah. of people thrown in this 
time of year especially. You can be listening to it any time, though, and be having a bad day. But it really is a time that, you know, I know myself, I look back and when our family was together and my parents were together and, you know, these good times. And I have a Christmas tree in front of me now. And thankfully, I'm in a great place celebrating Christmas, not looking at the past, um, but the future. But I haven't always been that way. And what can we do to create our own shift? And so our reality <clears throat> could be brighter. If that, I think yes. you know what I'm saying, what I'm asking, even if I didn't verbalize it so well. Mm. No, that's perfect. I love it. Uh, and there's quite a lot we can do. And you're right. That was more recently the focus of my work with my book, Quantum Jumps. And I'll just, uh, the, the idea in that book, mm-hmm. uh, you know, because it's, 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 people can get it if they want or take a look at it. But I've got a newsletter and I often include excerpts from it. I've got videos. There's a lot of free information out there. Um, and I'll share some of the tips from it. But the idea from the book is that we can experience literally jumping into uh, another reality. We can jump from one parallel universe to another. And in an instant, we can be smarter, happier, in a better relationship, more outgoing, more effective, more confident, have more willpower, suddenly have had enough sleep, even if we didn't. You know, these are all scientifically proven, laboratory-tested uh, things that I recommend in the book. But I'll just give you a few that are focused now for the holidays because I think that's important. Yeah, You're right. and things we can use now. And I, I'm so yeah. excited to find out more about this. You just gave me a little taste of something I, I don't know anything about. That's like, ooh. This could be <laughs> like a juicy orange to unpeel. Like, what the heck is she talking about? So what can we do now? Back to you. Back okay. To you. Well, I'm going to rephrase it in a term that people may feel comfortable with if they're familiar with placebo effect. Um, yes, yes. Or or you might have heard of William James talking about act as if yes, or power of positive thinking, positive psychology, you know, uh, fake it till you make it, yes. all that stuff. Okay. So why does that stuff work? Um, what I'm doing is I'm basically showing that we have now entered the quantum age. And in this point in time, it, it's not so much that nature has changed, but we are now aware that we're living in a, what's what you could call a superposition of states. We're living in parallel realities. And we've now hit the point where two thirds of the physicists that were polled at a conference, they agree we're definitely living in parallel realities. That means wow, we're two thirds. Yeah. So this is huge. And I think the young people experiencing the Mandela effect, they're starting, they're ready for it. They get it. I mean, they've seen the beginning of it. They know that things are changing Facts don't stay the same Um, in the form of placebos. I think people know that the power of placebo has now doubled in the last 30 years. It's become, uh, it's just, it's gone off the charts with efficacy. It's more like 70% started off like 35%. Placebo just means I shall please. And it came into existence after World War II when the field medics wanted to be able to help the fallen soldiers. All they, they'd run out of drugs. All they had left no painkiller at all. They just had salt solution in water. And oh. so, you know, doctors throughout for centuries, they've been just giving sugar pills, whatever they could. But this was the first mass application where doctors were noticing, okay, we're giving saline injections to our wounded soldiers. And quite a few of them, like I said, about 30% at that time would say, I feel better, doctor. Thank you for the painkiller. Now, the doctor doesn't say anything, but they know f- full well they just gave the soldier salt water in a shot. And they smile, pat him, put a bandage on and move on. And the doctors feel good. The patients feel good. Anyway, uh, that was the beginning of the placebo and just recognizing that it works a little bit. And all of our pharmaceutical drugs are tested against placebo in medical trials to see how they do. Bad news for pharmaceuticals is the placebo has been gaining ground. And for people of faith, it helps every type of therapy, but that's a large degree of part of the reason why the placebos have doubled in efficacy recently, I believe. And and the method of why is it happening? I'm telling you, I believe that we can look uh, to macroscopic quantum effects to being the reason for these sorts of changes happening. And it's not just with injections or sugar pills. It's also surgery. There's been sham surgery that's been proven 50% effective for Parkinson's. Yes. It's helped. Yeah, you've probably heard about this. I have. Uh, for, di- for different surgeries. 
Yeah. And all they did and was it, open them up and close them up, and then the person healed. That's right. That's mind-blowing. So I cover this in great detail in Quantum Jumps. I'm not going to go into it further, but if you okay. know about that, okay, that's I, I just want people to feel like, okay, I can follow you there. Yeah, I got yeah, it. Yeah. So, so we're just going to use that same uh, principle so that we can get through the holidays here. Uh, to apply this to our practical need right now. So some of us have lost loved ones. It's been a rough year mm-hmm. for a lot of us. A lot of death has happened um, in my life too. And so, and even though those of us that know, uh, you know, consciousness goes forever, love never dies. We know it. It's still hard. Yeah, we're human, so, and the body yeah, grieves human. whether we yeah. want it or not. It's part of That's being right. human. Yes. So let's give here's some holiday survival tips, quantum jumping ones. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds great. Okay. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sure. Cynthia. Yeah. Okay. So it's gonna sound kind of corny and silly, but uh, no problem. No yeah. problem. So we're gonna start with this whole idea of act as if and you just take take a clean pencil or pen and you can right now if people aren't operating heavy machinery, go ahead and put it in your mouth and just curl the edges of your mouth up on either side of your clean pen or pencil. And what you're doing right now, just hold it, just do that as if you're listening for about 20, 30 seconds. This has been proven to help people laugh at jokes that wouldn't laugh before doing this. And this is basically taking a page out of uh, positive psychology and embodied cognition studies that are proving that when you lead with your body, your mind and spirit follow. And so even though you don't feel like smiling, You've just put your muscles through a smile exercise. <laughs> it's kind of like, um, you know, <laughs> like push-ups for your face, you know, just smiling a little bit. I have it on mute because I have a pen in my mouth right now. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And so this, this is the first thing you can do. And then you can do that while you're thinking because I'm going to give you, hopefully you have a piece of paper nearby. Your next activity is you're going to just think about the last 24 hours and three things you feel grateful for. So, and it can be simple things. We're not changing the whole world here, but anything at all, just little things that you feel really grateful for. And for extra bonus points, add what you had to do with those three things. And that's what, extremely... What was the last part? What do you okay. mean? What you have yeah, to do? What, 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 um, why it is that you were involved in these things happening in the first place so that you even noticed them. Like you might be grateful, like I'm glad my teacher told me yesterday that I'm doing a little better. And then the, what you had to do with that was you went to class. So you showed up, you know, maybe you're dragging yourself through the holidays, but you were there. Hey, you I got there. one. Last night, I was the speaker on a worldwide webinar with Helping Parents Heal. And if people don't know about that, helpingparentsheal.org, they got a Facebook group. And they had me speak for an hour and a half to parents who've lost their children about my story. And at the end of it, I got so much positive feedback about how my words in this radio show really have helped people grieving. And so I can say I'm super grateful that I was there for that hour and a half at serving. And then why was I involved? It's because I've gone through a whole bunch of heartache that's led me on my path and now I'm at a point where I get to actually share it. So does that sum it up for a good example? Yeah, that's one. And then you okay. write down two so we, more. Okay. We can do that after <laughs> so we don't take all the time. But I got yeah, my paper. Yeah. I'm writing it down. But I want listeners to know. It yeah. could be you took you could you, maybe you took the dog for a walk okay. instead of you just open the back door and let the dog do its business. You know, you actually got out there and you went on a walk. Give yourself kudos. Okay. You know. So I, I want people to, because this is about pulling yourself up by the bootstraps. You might remember Oprah popularized gratitude journals where you write three things down that you're grateful for. Yes. We're, take, we're, we're now going a little bit further with advice from the father of positive psychology himself, which is to, uh, you start with like the Oprah list of the three things that went well, but you definitely, definitely, definitely rem- put yourself into those three things. And the, the pow- what this does is it helps people who are otherwise suicidal. I mean, some people get very depressed at the holidays Definitely. and this is not, yeah, this is very serious. And so even uh, that's why I'm suggesting put that pencil in your mouth, turn the corners of your mouth up, write these three things down, write what you had to do with it. 
it's okay if they're small. We don't have to do something amazing. Um, you know, if everyone's trying to match you, Sandra, they might feel depressed. But um, I, I want people to know, it could be, maybe you just put your shoes on. You know, you're grateful you had shoes and you put them on. Yeah. Good. Well, we're starting small here. And so, you know, we can work up to, you have your own radio show and so forth, but. Uh, hey, I, I have down days too. <laughs> you guys only hear the good stuff because I psych myself up, but I mean, I've got some, I've got some down days too. So this is, this yeah. is it, it's part of being human. I'm not superhuman, nor are and you. Me yeah. No. Yeah. Me too. Me too. So I'm, I just want people to know uh, that I, my heart goes out to you. I, um, my, my dad's sister just passed away a couple of weeks ago and she was, very close to me. So I'm dealing with grief this yeah. holiday season. So I, I, it's cuts close to home and, and anyway, you know, and so let's stay focused here. So those, mouth, those are three things, <laughs> our involvement in it, give ourselves yeah. kudos. Yep. Okay. Okay. One more for your stocking stuffer this time of year. And that's willpower. Cause a lot of us feel like, um, we know, we know what the right thing to do is, but we can't drag ourselves to do it. Right. Because, you know, again, the grief, the sadness, all that. So here's, uh, here's a quantum jumping tool to give yourself willpower when you don't have it. It also comes from martial arts, believe it or not. Uh, so what you can do is just put both of your hands, as long as you're not operating heavy machinery, make two fists with your hands. Make those fists really tight, as tight as you can, kind of like you're going to punch someone. And the right way to do it if you do martial arts, keep your thumb out on the outside. You know, don't, don't wrap your fingers around your thumb. Keep your thumb on the outside. Okay, so do that for like 10, 20 seconds. And then open your hands up. <coughs> Excuse me. Open your hands up as wide as you can. So the fingers are wide apart. And you may feel like you're not doing anything, but this, again, is laboratory tested, proven to help people have willpower when they want to keep um, either a good diet or do the right thing in, in certain situations. It's absolutely boosts your willpower. And I think we need willpower at this time of year, sometimes just to do everyday things that everyone expects of us. Oh, interesting. I've also heard putting our hands, our, like our fists on our hips, like in the Wonder, Man, Wonder Woman stance, uh, somehow that gives us power, the feeling of power. I've read that. So, yeah, that's I've got pictures in my book of that, and that's hmm. like a whole there's a whole section there. You've and got pictures does, in your book. Yeah, this is quantum jumps. Love a book got, with so, pictures. <laughs> yeah, jumps, so it's okay. good. It shows you how to strike those power poses. This is the work of Amy Cuddy. I told you, embodied cognition is behind a lot of the research here. And indeed, what happens when you strike the power poses? And uh, you described one. Uh, put your hands on your hips if you're standing. Um, stand with your legs apart. Another good one is if you've got like a dinner table and you can lean forward and put the palms of your hands on that table as you're leaning slightly forward. Another good one is uh, stretching your hands out. If you're sitting in a chair, just put your hands uh, either to the either side of you or behind your neck like that. <clears throat> and you can also stretch your hands up above your head. So all of these expansive gestures trigger uh, the same kind of things in the body that I was describing earlier with the smile and the pen. It's, mm -hmm. it's all body cognition. It's the body leading the mind and the spirit and just pulling you out of the hole that you might have fallen into. In the case of these um, put your hand on your hips poses, what's happening is you're, <clears throat> it's been proven that the stress hormones, you know, the, the fight or flight stuff is reduced you know, the cortisol uh, just goes down and the testosterone goes up. So people instantly feel more confidence. It boosts confidence. It reduces stress. And it gives you a feeling that you can get through something. It's not so much willpower, per se. Um, instead, it's more confidence in general. Oh, thank you for doing this research and sharing these. Because these are little things we can do when it might actually seem difficult to pick up a the phone and call somebody to get out of our own head or, or something like that. Uh, but they're really worth playing with the acting as if, wow, I dig it. <laughs> we only have a few minutes left and I, I'm sure there's things you want to share. I, I'm sorry to say, I didn't know the qu really good questions to ask you because I don't know your, your world yet. Um, but what else do you want to share while we have some time together? 
Well, I, I like the power of questions because I've found that often we don't know we're asking questions mm-hmm. because um, when people don't meditate, then then the mind is a little bit like an unkept house. And so the thoughts kind of run all over the place and it's sort of a mess in, on the inside. But you can tidy things up but just by simply starting um, with one question that can therefore kind of lead everything else to getting tidied up. It's my favorite question no matter how bad or good things might be. And it's just to invite our imagination to go onward and upward. And the question is, how good can it get? And it's, it, you can make it specific, like how good can this holiday season be? How good can my day be? How good can this phone call be? How good can this radio show be? Mm-hmm. Whatever it is. So it's, it's very open-ended. And it can become a beautiful um, sort of a mantra to even if you don't feel like anything is any good, uh, I'm just inviting people. Why not? You know, just you you might have some biases that are kind of blocking you temporarily, but they don't have to stay there. So I encourage people to uh, start clearing away some of the cobwebs of old belief systems that we got a view of, and what the bleep do we know? Yeah, <clears throat> definitely recommend that movie if no one's if you haven't seen mm-hmm. that. You know what? this how good can it get question um when you just said that i thought you know first reaction was oh geez i'm gonna have to work at doing something else that's my little inner critic but then all of a sudden i started thinking of times that i was really happy they just kind of started flooding back when it really was good times and so i can't think of those good times and not feel good that's right yeah there's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy to it and it does it sort of throws the white glove down, the challenge to our imagination, to the universe, to the cosmos, the angels, God, everybody, uh, to rise to that occasion. How good can it get? And it's it sort of flies in the face of our uh, standard social tendencies to look for what's wrong and what do we have yes, to fix. Yes, right, of course. And it's it's a completely different way of doing everything. And when you do it that way, we, I, I believe that we can all find solutions to seemingly insurmountable problems because I know for sure that there's a reality out there that's just adjacent to ours that we can jump to and we can do it together. Oh, that's such good news. So your website is realityshifters.com. That's right. And if we find ourselves there, how would you best say we navigate it? Especially for me now, I would love to get one of your books just to get a little bit more into this but which one and because this is totally new you know to me um so how could we best best use your website and you to right start digging in a little bit i I recommend the the new book is quantum jumps and it's the one i've been sharing some of the tips from it's great it's it's uh good for people even who might think this stuff sounds a bit woo woo so it's the least woo woo of my books okay (laughs) <laughs> which is good. If yeah. people like the, if they, if woo woo is not a problem, then they'll love reality shifts because that gets more into the artist's view of things. And it's a little bit more the, what you might call the right brain view, you know, sort of the artist intuitive side mm-hmm. view. Whereas quantum jumps is more mainstream and you can share it with your family and not be embarrassed about it. Not that you'd be necessarily embarrassed of reality shifts, but. Oh, I get um, it. I've got a book called yeah. We Don't Die. You know, that's not necessarily right. a coffee table book in every household just yet. What is high energy money? That one has to do with our beliefs regarding our prosperity. Mm-hmm. And so it shares uh, firsthand experiences that. That, my, that I myself and lots of people I personally know have had with money just showing up in their lives when they need it. You could call it money miracles. And it's, it includes very specific meditations and ac- energy practices to do, as well as a troubleshooting guide to, uh, to spot where your belief systems might need a tune-up um, with regard to your personal relationship with money, because it's, it's energy like everything else, and you have a relationship with it, which you can improve. So... It shows how to do that with lots, and it, it takes into account that different people have different approaches. Some people just want to find money. Some people want to work for it. Some people want to invest. And so it, it helps with re- regardless what your framework might be, because you can have money miracles in all of those cases. It, it happens for everybody. 
And if we can have money miracles, we can have health miracles, we can have relationship miracles. I think the sky's the limit. Well, thank you so much for being our guest today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Sandra. I really oh, love it. It's wild. And, and uh, thanks for bearing with me when I didn't get it. Hey, what's an unbirthday, by the way? I thought I knew, but then I... <laughs> I think it's from Alice in Wonderland. Uh-huh. You know, a very merry unbirthday to you. <laughs> That's where I first heard of it. Um, but it's just a party for no apparent okay. uh, reason. Yeah. I didn't know if it was somebody's day of physical death i thought no i don't think that's what she's talking about no <laughs> with one birthday. well thank you for being here and again uh, to our listener uh, we've just been talking to cynthia sue larson whose website is, whose website is realityshifters.com and also to you our listener i'd like to just really thank you we are approaching the end of the 2017 year and uh, of course you could be listening to this in 2023 and thinking this is way out of date by now you know everybody knows about quantum jumps and reality shifts when you're listening but for the time being when we're recording this i want to thank you for really putting not just listening but putting your life into it mapping the conversations we have not just being entertained by some of the guests but really saying okay how how does this impact my life and i think that's where the true value of any good book or any good radio show or any good course you take i think that's where the true value lies so thank you for that and as a reminder the home base is we don't die radio.com there's now over 220 episodes and uh, i've had people People tell me that they're in a new space in their life than they were two years ago, and they went back to listening to some of the earlier episodes. So if you get lonesome, know that uh, I love you. Cynthia loves you. There's lots of love around, and even maybe go back and check out a, a past episode. So I also want to invite you. We have our Afterlife Symposium coming up this September, and afterlifesymposium.org is the is the website. And I know we've been talking about quantum jumps and reality shifts. But there's some real state-of-the-art stuff happening in the world of afterlife communication and knowledge. And uh, even if you can't go to Scottsdale, Arizona in September, still check out that website to find out about some of these people and and the science behind what they're doing. Um, So that's afterlifesymposium.org. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain. I've been your host on We Don't Die Radio. And I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. So I do hope you use some of these great uh, new tools that we have from Cynthia and that you make it a great day. So I want to thank you for listening and we'll see you soon. 